So today we're focusing on the PIX240. As Scott said, it really uh, sh sort of shrank the size of all the gear that you need to get stuff done. All right, here it is, it's, it's very small. So first we'll note the accessories attached to it. I'll take you through the audio, the video, the time code, and finally the media, because the media is really exciting, um, really cool things going on. First, let's talk about the accessories, all right? In order to get your PIX240 to work properly, you're gonna need a couple of accessories, like a Canon C300, a Zeiss Compact Prime, a CP2 100 millimeter lens. Come on, guys, you don't have your Canon C300s yet? Call us up, we'll, we'll, we'll remedy that situation for you. But uh, honestly, the real accessories that you're gonna need, a pair of Sony style NPF 970 batteries, PIX240, um, you know, Sound Devices makes their own sort of knockoff batteries, you can go with those, you can go with the Sonys. You do need a camera arm, you need an arm to mount it to your camera, and a nice little HDSDI or HDMI cable. All right, once you've got those accessories in place, you're ready to rock, okay? You no longer need an additional monitor. Beautiful 800 by 480 monitor right here, uh, gorgeous high definition. And, and now let's get into, now let's get into the, the real meat of this stuff. So sound devices, they've been around for a while, all right? You know them as an audio device manufacturer. They've been making rugged field equipment since 1984, all right? So the stuff that they make is designed for field use. It's not fragile, it's not going to break, it's, uh, it's not going to cry if it gets a little milk spilled on it, that sort of thing. Sound Devices makes rugged field uh, recorders. And specifically, they've been known in the past for audio recorders. So when we've got two XLR inputs in here, uh, as well as accepting digitally embedded audio on SDI and HDMI, you know that they're gonna be up to Sound Devices quality. So very low noise, negative 128 decibels, in fact, on the audio and digital inputs coming in. You've got a five pin line out, all right? So you, you're gonna need yourself a little five pin to dual XLR three pin adapter if you wanna take meaningful audio out of it live. Or if you're coming out HD SDI out, you've got your audio embedded, okay? So embedded on the input, embedded on the output. Again, because it's sound devices, you know that the audio quality that's gonna be recorded is absolutely flawless. I believe we are at 41 kilohertz. Yeah, low noise. Mic line and uh, mic plus phantom power as options. It's also got a built-in limiter, built-in high pass filter, optional. You don't have to have those on. In the menu system, you turn them on and you turn them off. I'm gonna wrap up audio there. Let's talk about video just for a second. Importantly, you can record in Avid's DNX HD codec or Apple's ProRes 422 codec, all right? The ProRes 422 stuff is 10 bits and your uh, your, your data rate can be anywhere from light and proxy to standard and HQ. So HQ is 240 megabits per second. You can get extremely high quality, 10-bit quantized uh, words at the 422 color space. So let's say you're on, as uh, Scott from Mad Crazy Production was, uh, an AF100, right? You're limited internally to the camera to 24 megabits per second, 420 color space. There are a host of other cameras that have these limitations on their internal recording codecs. So one, one obvious advantage of recording to this external recorder is you're freeing yourself from the 420 color space, you're at 422, you're freeing yourself from the 8-bit words recorded in AVC cam and the other sort of codecs uh, of the smaller cameras, you're at a 10-bit recording 422 color space here in, in video land. Also importantly, when you are outputting from some of these cameras, if you wanted to get yourself a 24p, right, progressive codec, or a 30p progressive codec, your output from these cameras sometimes force you into a 5994 interlaced world. So although it looks 24P, they're sort of doing a, a, a pull down to write that 24P look onto a 5994i signal. The sound devices, importantly, has the capacity to do a reverse telecine. So you take your 24P over 60i and get that over 60i out of there. You can turn it back into native 24 progressive or, 34, or, or 30 progressive frame rates. Why is that important? Well, if you're going to the internet, as some of our favorite show hosts like to do sometimes, you're gonna be displaying on a progressive monitor. All right, so if you're starting interlaced and you end up progressive, you're gonna get at, you know, jaggy lines and diagonal artifacting ugliness. You wanna be in progressive. If you're on a camera, such as Sony's NEX FS100, Panasonic's AF100. When you're outputting your 24p or your 30p, it's doing a pull down. It's doing a, you know, a 24 to 60 pull down. The sound devices can get rid of that for you. Turn it right back into progressive 
either in DNxHD or in ProRes, so you're ready to encode. You're ready to uh, go directly to post without having to do any capturing, without having to do your reverse telecine on the input. Fantastic. So that sort of covers our audio and our video highlights. So unless we've got any questions coming in from the internet, I want to talk to you about timecode for a moment. There's a company called Ambient. Ambient is famous for their Locket, right? Their Locket brand of timecode products. Scott mentioned <clears throat> in his video that he does some multi-camera work. When you're doing multi-camera work, you've got to have timecode and genlock. You've got to make sure that all of your cameras are sort of synced so that when you're editing later, when you're editing your ISO, your ISO recordings, you can match them all up, right? You don't want to. Uh, you don't want to be digging through hours and hours of media. You want to say, all right, I need my wide shot at this time code. I want my close up at this time code. So you've got to get your stuff sort of, <coughs> excuse me. You've got to have your stuff locked up to the same time code clock. Built in internally to the sound devices, PIX240, an ambient lock it time code generator. All right, so you can tell your sound devices to be the master time code clock for your multi camera shoots. If that's not your style, if you sort of have an external timecode generator, not a problem at all. You've got a BNC input, LTC timecode, right here. Can we go to Ramsey's for a second, get a close-up at the bottom? Mm, you know what, Verge, do you have a picture of the, of the video inputs on the, on the PIX240? That might, yeah, now we're talking. All right, so on the bottom, you've got your HDSDI in and your loop output. But right above that, you've got a timecode, in or out, and a sync out. So that serves as your time code and your genlock connector, right? So this way, you don't have to waste a frame or two while your switcher uses its built-in frame sync function. You can do a, a proper sync between genlock and time code for all three of your cameras using the PIX240 as the source, as your master clock. Very important. Um, uh, you, you, it, it's, tough to, it's tough to underestimate the importance of timecode, particularly in a multi-camera setup. If you're not using an external timecode recorder, if you want to use your EX3, your, if you want to use your EX3 or some other camera as your timecode source, this is not a problem. You can tell your PIX240, accept incoming timecode, and it doesn't have to be a separate linear LTC timecode. It can actually read the timecode coming in from the HDSDI or the HDMI embedded timecode. All right, so Sony's got HDMI timecode embedded on some of their NXCAM products. PIX240 can read it. Pretty awesome.